Now you can hear me. Okay. Good. I would like to thank all of you here in Cincinnati who braved the ice and the cold to come out tonight. I know this morning I was wondering if we would even have the Bible study because it was the weather was so bad, the roads were so bad, but uh, we know many people, of course, stayed home, and hopefully you're hooked up on the webcast. I'd like to thank and welcome everyone that is on the webcast. Uh, the last time we did this, we had a very good uh, turnout, a uh, large number of people who were uh, joined the Bible study that uh, Mr. Myers did last month. And this is the second in a six-part series uh, about the Passover that we're going to be going through uh, between now and Passover season. And each one will build on the one before it. So if you miss one, that's okay, because you just go on the website and you can see it. But if you do miss one, I really encourage you to go back and watch the one you missed, because um, we're going to be covering a, covering a lot of information over these six Bible studies. Um, and like I said, each one builds. There's bits and pieces of this sort of large puzzle of the plan of God that we're going to be putting together, and uh, all six of them work together. So just want to remind you that next month, well, actually, it's the end of this month, February the 19th, the middle of this month, uh, Darius McNeely will be going through Jesus and Reconciliation. So the third in these series will be in two weeks, and that's February 19th, uh, Jesus and Reconciliation. Okay, if you'll please rise. Bow your heads. Great Father and King, we come before you in, in all of the fact that we have this book, and this book tells us what you're doing. And Father, we have to have the faith to believe that this book is from you, but if we do, then this book is amazing because it unlocks the whole purpose for humanity and unlocks your plan for us when we live in a very confusing and difficult world. And yet, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, and you actually are going to solve the problems of humanity, just as you can solve our problems in our everyday lives. But we have to understand this big picture, and a lot of that ties in, Father, into understanding the meaning of the Holy Day. So these, these six Bible studies are so important. We ask you to open our hearts and minds to get out of your Scripture what you want us to learn. And there's so much, Father, but with your help, if you open our hearts and minds, we can understand, we can be enlightened. So we ask you for your guidance and your direction. We thank you and we praise you and we ask all this in the name of the one who makes it all possible, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a passage in Revelation 5, we won't turn there, but it's a fascinating passage where John is given a vision of heaven. And there uh, they announce that there's a scroll, but nobody is qualified to open the scroll. And then it says that there is a person qualified to open the scroll. He is the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. It's very interesting, and of course, as you go through that entire chapter of Revelation 5, you see that it's Jesus Christ. And there are a number of hymns in that uh, chapter to Jesus Christ and the Father, but worshiping Him as the one who is qualified to open the scroll. Now, that's an interesting passage because why is it that God says, I have a scroll, and he looks out over all of humanity. He looks out over all the angels. He looks out over everyone he's ever created. And he says, you know, there's only one person who I deem can open the scroll. And he is the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. Now, the Lion of Judah is a totally different subject. It's a fascinating subject in its own. How Jesus Christ is a seed of Abraham and comes through Judah. And it goes clear back through prophecies made to Abraham in, in, in Genesis, it carries on through how he is the Lion of Judah. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But we're talking about and leading up to here the Passover, where Jesus is the Lamb. So that passage has to do with, when we look at the Holy Days, it has to do with Jesus coming, you know, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, as the Lion of Judah. 
But when we look at the lamb, it has to do with the fact that he came as the Passover lamb. So how does, what does it mean that he is qualified to open the scroll? Why is he making this point? Only he can do this. Now, today we're going to deal with some really big concepts. This is, you know, sometimes you give a Bible study and it's, it's, you're in the details. And sometimes you deal with big concepts. This is a concept Bible study. Big concepts that will help you over the next couple of months as you prepare for the Passover and understanding part of what God is doing and why He's doing it the way He is. This is what amazes me. I've asked many times, God, why, why did you do it this way? Why is your plan set up this way? Why didn't you set it up a different way? But as you see more and more what God does, the holy, holy day supply a key. Because every holy day is about what God is doing in His plan of salvation, specifically through Jesus Christ. You begin to realize the absolute genius, absolute genius of God. There are other statements made in the Bible about Jesus Christ. It says that He learned. He's the captain of our salvation. In another place it says He learned through His suffering. He's also called the second Adam. For years and years, the term second Adam seemed confusing to me. I mean, I know, we all know, that Jesus Christ was the Word, and Jesus Christ became a man, but why is He the second Adam? Well, all this eventually ties into the Lamb of God and the fact that He's the Lion of Judah, the King of Kings, and the Passover. So we're going to tie this in and look at it in terms of both of those, although we're going to zero in on the Passover, you can't separate the fact that He's both. And what God is doing through him is because he is both. Here's the problem. We're presented with a problem as human beings. And the pro when we're born, we're born into a problem. <laughs> we're born physical, and we're born into a world that doesn't work. It doesn't work. We're born into a world, a world that has evil in it. We're born into a world that's unfair. We're born into a world where many human beings say, if there is a God and He made this mess, He's either very weak or very evil, right? I've talked to many people over the years who have said, if God would allow this much suffering, how can I worship that God? Well, let's go back to the root cause of the problem. And then we're going to look at God's solution because His solution is nothing you and I can make up. We can never make up this solution. So let's go back to Genesis 1.26. Genesis 1.26. Remember, this is a big concept Bible study. So we're going to be going from major concept to major concept. Many of them could be a Bible study or a sermon in itself. But sometimes you have to look at the bigger picture to understand where the details fit. Otherwise, all we have are details. You know, one of the major problems in the world that you and I live in is context. The world you and I live in, we are given so much information. It's like someone dumps into our lap a 5,000-piece puzzle, but they don't show us what it's supposed to look like. Not only that, some of the pieces come from different puzzles, and there are thousands of pieces missing. So we're putting together a puzzle, puzzle that doesn't even fit, pieces are missing, and we have no idea what it's supposed to look like. This is where context means something. What is it supposed to look like? What is this supposed to look like? Well, let's go back to why the world, now you, the world that you and I live in is so messed up. Genesis 1, verse 26. And then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. When God created human beings, now remember, we're looking at God's kingdom. God's kingdom is the universe. God owns everything. God owns you and I. This is what sometimes we have a hard time accepting. Every human being thinks that we're our own little God. You know, I'm my God. You're your God. We get the, our lives belong to us. Well, actually, we're, we're owned by our creator. But God owns everything. It's his kingdom. And he took this earth and he said, okay, you get to run this. It's your dominion. 
They're in charge of the earth. So, if you read the story, do it my way, and this will really work. Told Adam and Eve, look, you told the man, I'll show you how it works. Here's a woman. And like Adam's like, oh, wow, you really know what you're doing. You know, you're good, okay? Everything they did, you think about it, no conflict between Adam and Eve, and there's no conflict between them and God. It all works. You're in charge of this. Just do it the way I tell you. And things really will be happy. Be, it'll all work out. Now, if you don't, and you decide to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then it's going to not work. Because the moment you do that, your decisions will be made on a mixture of what I tell you and a mixture of what you're going to come up with. And, of course, they didn't realize what Satan told them. They had dominion. This was our earth. Now, you know the story. Satan comes along, and what does he do? Satan comes along and says, you know, God doesn't know what he's doing. And, you know, you're really in charge of this mess, or you're in charge of this, but it could be better. Oh, I know it's good, but it could be better. Because you could be like God. So they gave in to him. Now, this is a long process of how this has worked out through the Scripture. So I'll just take you to the end of it. Okay? What happened was, he became what Paul called the God of this world. Now, Satan, once he became their God, he convinced them that good and evil was better than good. Human beings had dominion over the earth, but it was under God's dominion. Here's what happened. We, you know, the human race, we gave our dominion to Satan. And the reason I say that is because, think about something. If God is the ruler of the universe and Satan convinces us to give, human beings, to give our little part of it, that he says, okay, you're in charge of this. Let's see what you can do with it. This is exciting. This is great. Look what I've done. You know, first thing you told Adam, let's name the animals. Man, you're going to love this, right? Look what I've done. I've created this. This is for you. And you get to take care of this. And then he kicked them out of Eden and said, now you're going to take care of it yourself. And it won't work. And then Satan became the god of this world. Does that mean that God was no longer in charge of his kingdom? Well, of course he was. Does it mean that God was somehow diminished in power? No. Was God qualified to still reign over his kingdom? Remember, Satan didn't take God's dominion away. Whose dominion did he take? He took ours. You know, it's time I think we get a little angry with Satan, but that's another, that's another route to go on. He took what God gave us and has convinced us that God doesn't know what he's doing. And only God's way works, so we messed it up. And he just keeps helping us mess it up. And we gave him dominion over us. And we became slaves. And here's the problem. Once Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, they could not break their slavery. Slavery is the theme of Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread, right? It's a major theme through the Passover Days of Unleavened Bread. You and I became slaves of Satan the moment you and I were born, I think it probably started before we were born. And we became his slaves. And so we live in a world that doesn't work. Under his dominion. But God is still in charge. Now, once, and we're going to go through some scriptures to talk about this, once Satan, or once we, you know, Adam and Eve, and I say we, you know, it's easy to say, wow, Adam and Eve, I can't wait to meet them. I've had people say this. You know, boy, am I going to give them a piece of my mind. you got to understand, if you and I had been in the garden and exposed to Satan, you know what each of us would have done? The exact same thing. If that's not true, God's not fair. We'd have all done the exact same thing. We're pretty predictable, okay? We think we're complicated. God's complicated. We're not. We're pretty predictable. So, the moment that happened, 
there were three things that came into human experience. We no longer had dominion. We were not rulers of our own little world that God gave us to it. We weren't rulers of our own play box anymore. It was like a bully came into the playground and beat us up, and now we all have to do what the bully says. And we lost our little playground. And there were three things that happened. I'm not trying to trivialize it, trivialize it. I'm just saying we were children. We are children. And Satan came along. And there's three things now that we experience. One is Satan. Okay, can you see that? I know it's not very dark. Can you see it in the back? It says Satan, okay? Uh, one is sin. We all have experienced rebellion against God. We all have experienced disobeying His law. We all have experienced our thoughts and emotions against God. And the third thing is death. Every human being dies. It is the result of his dominion. Satan, sin, death. So here we are. All good. What a great story. Here's the problem with the gospel message. You know what the problem with the gospel is? It has the good news. The good news has zero impact until you first tell everybody, oh yeah, your problem is you gave up your dominion, and you're ruled by Satan, sin, and death. Oh, wow, that's a great way to get you know, people all excited. This is where the gospel starts, because there is no good news except in relationship to this. Satan, sin, death. Now, it's easy, at that point, though, God immediately had a plan. It was all prepared. He was going to fix this. He was going to fix this. He knew what he was going to do. He knew how this would work out. And this has to do with the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. One of the things he told Adam and Eve was, Genesis 3.16, that he would bruise Satan, he would conquer Satan through one of their seed. I want you to remember something. This is important. Satan didn't overcome God's dominion. I know you say, yeah, that's obvious. Well, wait a minute. Whose dominion did he take? Ours. He took the human dominion that God had given. God could have taken it back any time he wanted. You think God, after he kicked Adam and Eve out of Eden, could have said, okay, Satan, you're gone. Yes. But it didn't fix Adam and Eve. Because who gave dominion to Satan? Adam and Eve. Not God. The problem here isn't God, <laughs> stating the obvious. The problem is us. He gave humanity dominion. We gave it up. So, he said to Adam and Eve, okay, I'm going to fix this through a human being. Now, the problem is, and I, I can't imagine what Satan must have thought then. It was like, oh yeah, try it. Uh, Satan's been beating human beings. He's been defeating human beings ever since, right? Yeah, you're going to beat me through a human being. Well, it wasn't going to be just any human being. Isaiah 9. Okay, these are obvious, you know, you've, you've probably figured out where I'm going on some of this, but stay with me here because we have to realize and these big, we have to put these big concepts into place. Now, the details of the puzzle begin to make sense. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. This is one of the great messianic prophecies. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder dominion, rulership, which human beings were given and it was taken away from them. So here is a child, a human being, and his name will be called, now this just isn't any other child, 
This child has to be different than any other human being that ever existed. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over His kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so here we have this and a host of Messianic prophecies that talk about there's going to come time that there will be a human being, a descendant of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David. But he wouldn't be just like everybody else. He would also be Almighty God. Almighty God. The battle between Satan and human beings is unequal. You and I can't beat him on our own. The battle between human beings and Satan is unequal. There isn't a human being that is capable on our own of beating him. The battle between Satan and God is unequal. Satan can't defeat God. It is not possible for Satan to defeat God. Now, we have to understand that. You and I can never defeat Satan on our own, and Satan can never defeat God. But it wasn't God's dominion that he took. And I, I'm driving this home because I want you to understand why God made you. Why you have life. What is the purpose of your life? And it goes back to God created human beings to have dominion over His earth. And there's a reason for that. And He knew that we can't beat Satan. And we knew that He can. But He told from the very beginning, a human being will defeat Him, but He won't be a normal human being. He's also going to be God. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. So we're moving forward in these very broad concepts that each one. I mean, we could go through two hours just going through Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And then we could go through another two hours of Messianic prophecies being fulfilled in the New Testament. Okay. But once again, concept. Let's go to Hebrews 2 and verse 9. Now, if I was Mr. Myers giving a Bible study on Hebrews, we would spend the next three hours on the next two verses. But we will move forward. <laughs> Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. <coughs> Huge verse. Huge verse. He became human so that he could die for everyone. Now we know Jesus preexisted. We know that John 1 1 talks about how he, the Word, was with God and the Word was God. We know that he was divine. We know that He became human so that He could die. What are the reasons? For it was fitting for Him, for whom all things, and by whom all, are all things, this is verse 10, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hey, why did God give human beings dominion over the earth? Because we were made in His image. Why were we made in the image of God? Because we're His children. If you can grasp that, your life will never be the same. You are God's child. God created us because He wanted kids. And He gave us our playground. And we gave it to the bully, and we got kidnapped, 
And we think the bully is better than dad. There's the gospel. And God's going to take it back and give it back to us. Okay, there it is. There's the gospel. God has a way he's going to do that. Now, God could have come down any time and beat Satan up. He said, I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to do it through one of you. Why would he do it through one of us? Well, you can't do it, so I'm going to send the word to become like you. Well, why would you do that? Why don't you just beat him up? <laughs> I, I understand. Why would you go through all the trouble, you know, the word saying, okay, that's what I'll do. I will divest myself of my privileges, as it says in Philippians, and I will become a human being. Why would you do that? Why would you just beat Satan up? Throw him out? Well, let's see, he goes on here. Verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now stop. Jesus Christ came to become the captain of your salvation through sufferings. You say, well, what does it mean through suffering? I want you to think about something. What is it like to have memory of being God? to be in constant contact with the Father in a way that you and I can't imagine, that we've never experienced. And I don't mean to be gross here, but we have to understand the enormity, enormity of, the, of the sacrifice and get hungry or have to go to the bathroom. Think about that. This is God. This is God. And He becomes like us, which means that when He was hammering something as a carpenter, or probably more of a stonemason, and He pounds His thumb with a hammer, guess what it does? It hurts. Right? Bang. It hurts. Now, had that ever happened to Him as God? No. So why would He do it? You don't think he knew it was going to hurt? He designed us. God designed pain. We also know that Jesus Christ was the creator by which whom God created, or through whom God made all things. In Colossians, it said, that's a wait a minute. Wait a minute. He designs pain, and then he comes and feels it? Why would you do that? Just go beat Satan up. <laughs> because this is more than defeating Satan. He says, he is not ashamed to call them my little creations. He is not afraid to call them the little dirt balls I made. He's not afraid to call them, you know, hairless apes. He says, I'm not ashamed to call them my brothers. It's one thing to say I'm going to create a family. It's another thing to create a family. And you and I can't get to where God is, say He came to us. And that was decided from the foundation of the earth. That was decided from the foundation of the earth. The moment He let Satan into the Garden of Eden, He knew. He knew. I have to become like one of them because that was the plan. That's what's amazing to me. Could you have ever thought that up? I'd have never thought of that up. I'd have never come up that my wildest dreams. And God says, the only way we're going to get them, because guess what these little kids are going to do, we're going to have to send you the Word who has been my companion forever, and you're going to go down there, and you're going to become like them, so that they will understand they have a brother. And he's not ashamed to call us brethren. God, the Word, 
is not afraid or not ashamed to say, hey, that's my, that's my brother. That's my sister. It starts to put a whole new light on this, doesn't it? He goes on in, in verse 14, As as much then as the children, and he's talking about us, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shaved, uh, shared in the same, because we are made of this stuff, he became of this stuff. Because that's family. God could teach us family. He did it. There's no greater sacrifice than becoming God into stuff. <laughs> he became stuff so he could show us, so he could teach us. This is what family's like. This is what life is like. This is how it's lived. And you'll never figure it out looking at us, as, you know, looking to God. So I'm going to come down there and I'll show you how it works. He's, but notice he says that through death, through death, he might destroy him who has power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He came to defeat Satan. And he did. I think, I can't imagine when, when this is hard to grasp. There's a point where the word eternally at the, at the right hand of God, the Father, eternally in, in this companionship that is so close. He says, hey, we're one. He doesn't say, I am one. He, he says, we are one. In other words, we're, we're, we're so close. We're in a relationship that is, that is just humanly almost impossible. Well, it is impossible to totally understand. He says, this is who we are, and we want to get you involved in this. Uh, so I'm going to become like you, and I'm going to come down into this bondage, and I'm going to be Satan. And Satan had to think when the word suddenly was an embryo. I want you to think about that. I can't imagine what the angel, you know, it says the angel shouted for joy when, he cre when he, they saw the physical creation. It was like, how does he do that? I can't imagine what it is to say, he's there. There's this teenage girl walking around. He's there. He's, he's in there. And Satan's going to be thinking, oh, God blew it this time. I defeated every human being he's created, and I'll defeat him now. And what, does, what did Jesus do? He said, well, I'm not just like any other human being. I'm also God. And he beat him. His whole life, he beat him and he beat him and he beat him. Why? Because well, he was going to release us from death. There you go. So he's going to defeat Satan, the cause of death, and he was going to defeat death. So, he came here. He's now the Lamb of God. He's the Lion of Judah only in, in the way that he, that he is actually a descendant of, of Judah and of David. He doesn't have any power as King of Kings yet on this earth. By the way, did Jesus have to come here because, well, he somehow had to beat Satan so he could be in charge? He already was in charge. It's we that weren't in charge. It's us. We weren't in charge of our dominion anymore. So he became like us. I can't imagine the frustration of Satan. He beats me as a man. He beats me as a man. Yeah. He really has that much contempt for God. He became like us so he could defeat Satan who causes death. So he came to defeat Satan. Now, how does he defeat sin? 1 Corinthians 15. As we go through and talk about the Passover, this will come up over and over again when we talk about his blood and, and, and his body being beaten, he defeats sin. So 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Okay, I get some yeses. That's good. That's good. Verse 1. 
Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which you, which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, So I gave you the gospel. Now, if you want salvation, you have to hold on to this gospel. You have to hold on to this message. For I delivered to you first of all, it can be translated from the Greek, of most importance. And he says, well, I'm going to tell you the gospel. You know what? This is the most important to this gospel message. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay. He died for our sins. Now, we've already read that, that He would die for our sins. So, he defeats sin. Now, he dies for our sins, the death penalty. But there is a problem. Jesus dying for our sins gives us the opportunity to receive forgiveness. Okay? It doesn't change your nature. Jesus could defeat Satan, which he did. That was, good. that was a done deal from the beginning. He was going to defeat Satan. It was going to be hard because he was going to experience things he had never experienced as God. But he was going to do it. He made us that way, so he was going to come be like us. He defeated sin and that he died for it. He is the Passover. So the, the blood, you know, it could pa the Passover can pass over us so that we don't have to pay our eternal penalty for our sins. But you know, there's a problem still. And that is, God forgives me of my sin, but I'm still a sinner. I have a problem. The problem is not solved. The Satan, Satan can be defeated. I can be forgiven of my sins. And the problem is still not solved because I'm still a sinner. I am still unqualified to be a child of God because I am still by nature... How did... Uh, think about it. How did uh, Paul put it? I am still by nature a child of wrath. I am still by nature a child of Satan whose dominion I've lived under all my life. So it's not done yet. So, let's go now to 1 Corinthians 15, 14. So let's skip down to verse 14. 1 Corinthians 15 is one of Paul's most brilliant arguments. Paul is amazing to me. I mean, sometimes he's all over the place. He's thinking like a, a Jewish rabbi, and sometimes he is like a, um, a Greek scholar, and sometimes he leads you into a box that you can't get out of. Verse 14. If Christ is not risen, so we talk about Christ's resurrection, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Now, I want you to verse 17, though, is where we're going. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, now notice the last part of his argument. Because you're still in your sins. Oh, his death was for our forgiveness because his life was worth more than all of us. But if God died and he's not risen, then he's not God. If God died and he wasn't resurrected, He's not God. And therefore, we are still in our sins. It takes God now removing sin from us for death to finally be, finally be defeated. For sin and death to finally be defeated. This is not just... Here, here's the problem. The Protestant world many times says, God came, sent Jesus to die for our sins, so now no matter what we do matters, God loves us, and they believe in, in, in uh, 
grace that cannot be denied. You receive God's grace, ah, it doesn't matter what you do after that. Repent, well repentance is accept Jesus in your heart, say I'm a sinner, uh, please forgive me, you're forgiven, at that moment you have eternal life, you could go out and be a mass serial killer, it really doesn't matter. You know, that's not defeating sin. How is letting everybody do evil while saying, I forgive you, defeating sin? When he says defeating sin, it's what he means. So if he's already defeat, defeated Satan, guess whose sin he now has to defeat? Mine. Because I am by nature a child of wrath. I am by nature a sinner. That has to be defeated. It's just not forgiveness he's offering us. It's not just beating up the bully. It's taking us clear back to the knowledge of good and evil and saying, now which do you choose? And it's us saying, good. Just, I don't want the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I want good. I want to be who I'm supposed to be. I want Jesus Christ as my brother. I want you as my father. I want to be part of this family. And the Lamb of God makes this possible. The Lamb of God makes this possible. So he has to be doing something now. Now I want you to think about what's going to happen during the Days of Unleavened Bread. Either before or afterwards, or I mean during the Days of Unleavened Bread, you're going to get sermons and sermonettes about ancient Israel coming out of Egypt. And they're going to, you know, it's going to talk about how, or the, whoever's giving the message, how that is a type of what we go through. You know, ancient Israel was hopelessly trapped in slavery. They couldn't get out of it. And Pharaoh was Satan, okay? Just like we're hopelessly trapped in sin and can't get out of it, and Satan's over us. So God had to send somebody to save them. He sent Moses. And he opened the Red Sea, and off they went through the Red Sea, which is a type of baptism, and then it closed behind them, and now Pharaoh was defeated, and Egypt was defeated. He said, well, sin was defeated too. How long did it take them to start acting like slaves again? Not very long. How long was it till they were complaining and griping and turning against God and trying to kill Moses? Not very long. Satan being defeated doesn't defeat the sin that's in you and me. That's a whole other work. Defeating Satan is child's play to God. It's not an equal battle. Even taking the word and making him flesh wasn't an equal battle. But you and me, yeah, we're a real project. This is the proof of God's greatness. To defeat sin inside of you and me. That's, that's an interesting problem. And so he now begins to defeat sin in each one of us. And so we will talk about taking in this unleavened bread. during the days of unleavened bread. We'll talk about removing sin, right? Why do we throw out the leavening? Because it's a ritual? No, it's about removing sin. What's that about? It is literally about defeating sin. It is about taking sin out of us. And like I said, dealing with Satan was child's play to God to deal with this. This still did not give us back our dominion. Because Satan has done all of us. He's infiltrated into our thinking. So, defeating Satan does not give us back our dominion. So, he wants to defeat the sin that's in every one of us. Colossians 1, verse 12. The poor guys that are... Oh, it's not up here. I'm looking around. They're putting on the, on the web, they're putting up scriptures... I only gave them, I don't know, 250 verses. And they're trying to sort through as I go through this and figure out which ones I'm using. Colossians 1, verse 12. I told them, I only have three hours worth of material. So I went to your pastor. 
And I said, I only have three hours worth of material. He said, well, you can have an hour and like 15 minutes. I won't. But he said I could. Colossians 1, 12. See, the reason I said that is if I go five minutes over, you'll go, wow, I'm sure glad he didn't do what Mr. Meyer said. Colossians. You always make yourself look good by making somebody else look bad. You know <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, that's funny. Colossians, Colossians 1.12. Giving thanks to the Father, okay, to God our Father. Boy, now Father becomes a, a, a real important word, doesn't it? Giving thanks to our Father, who has qualified us. He's done something to us that gives us a quality we did not have. That gives us a power we did not have. That gives us something we did not have. Who has qualified us as to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son of His love. And whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Sin is being defeated, is being defeated in every one of us, which means we get an inheritance. What is the inheritance that God has given Jesus Christ? The only human being to defeat Satan. Oh, I know, he, Satan was outclassed from the beginning, but, you know, because he was also God. But what, but what does he give him? He says, I give him all things. Now, I want to ask you, what is not included in all things? Could someone tell me that something, anything, that's not included in all things? What's the inheritance that's offered to us? He says, I'll give your dominion back, but you will worship and you will follow the one who made this possible because from the very beginning, Satan came and kidnapped you and from the very beginning, I had set up, God the Father says, I had set up someone, my son, my companion, who was with me and who was me. Now, there's of the same type, of the same kind in this relationship. And he said, he's going to come, and when he does, he's going to defeat Satan. He's going to defeat sin through dying for our sins which you and all deserve. He's going to take that penalty on himself to show us that we're brethren. Okay, you're my brother. I'll do this for you. And, you know, you're my sister. I'll do this for you. And he's going to defeat death. And he's going to do this so you can get your inheritance. And it's actually a lot bigger than the Garden of Eden. His original purpose for us wasn't just the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had no concept of that. His original purpose was all things. Sometimes we think, oh, God's holding back stuff from me. That's okay. I'll give you all things, he says. Your inheritance is my family, as my children. But you will obey, what's he also called? The firstborn. You will obey your brother, because he's just not your brother. He's also God. But he also is one of you. Because it was his price, it was his suffering, it was his doing, it was his work that made all this possible. And that's, another, that's why another place he says, every knee will bow to him. Before someone goes in the lake of fire, they will still bow to Jesus Christ. Because the Father is going to make it happen. Why? Because he said, he's the one with, through whom I did all this. I, the genius of the Father. And the submission of the Word is beyond comprehension. And the Holy Days teach us all this. The last thing says He will defeat is death. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. And look at our last couple verses here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. See, this is big concepts. No, these are big concepts. There's more than one. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20.
he says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's the first one to be resurrected from the dead. It's another one. It was another part of the plan. Uh, Pentecost will tell us more about that. For those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death. Now, okay. Why did death come? Because Adam followed Satan. So since death came into the experience of all of us through our first physical father, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, and he puts an end to all rule, all authority, and all power. For he must reign, now we're actually into the millennium, where he's the Lion of Judah. For he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. It's the last of these three things that's destroyed. It's destroyed in the lake of fire. Remember, what is thrown in the lake of fire in Revelation? Death. Death is thrown into the lake of fire. In other words, there's no more human beings around. There's only the children of God. We actually have part of what happens on the eighth day here, by the way. You know, the eighth day of the feast, what we call the last great day. It says that, uh, let me find here. When he delivers the kingdom to God. There is a point when it's all done and the earth is destroyed by fire and all those, on the, all those who have died who are incorrigible. Satan and the demons are removed when the one that we know as Jesus Christ has defeated Satan, defeated sin, defeated death. And then what's he do? The Father's coming down to New Jerusalem, and He says, Father, Abba, Daddy, here's the kids. Here it is. Here's the kingdom. Here's the dominion that they gave up. And just like you had it planned, I got it back. They gave it up, but he, got, he took it back. It would have been so much easier for the Father to turn to the Word and say, go throw Satan out. But you know what? It wouldn't have saved us. See, he could have thrown Satan out, but we still had sin and death. So if he would have thrown Satan out, we still would have got our dominion back. He had to defeat all of it. And he came and he defeated all of it. And there's a point here where he gives the kingdom, he gives the dominion to the Father. He says, we, we did it. Here it is. Here's the family. The dominion is back. And they get it this time. They get it this time. And death, death is destroyed. It no longer exists. Verse 45 We'll end here, verse 45. A little passage here. We'll read a couple verses. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. The word became there in, is not there in the original Greek. It basically means Adam became a living person. But the second Adam was an eternal being. But there had to be two Adams because he took Adam's dominion. So God said, okay, I'll make another Adam. Uh, but this one, you won't get this. I, I just can't imagine what went through the angel's mind when he actually did it. I'm going to beat him down on his own terms with a human being because there are kids and they'll have a brother, and this is the way I'll do it. 
So he says, verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. Eh, you and I are still made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. It was the man of dust, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now let that sink in a minute. Just you and I were made like Adam. We failed like Adam, but we will be like a, the heavenly man. We will be like the Son of God who came to this earth to be our brother, to die for our sins, to defeat Satan, to destroy death. And this is why this is so much more than just, oh good, I'm forgiven now, I can do whatever I want. Sin has to be defeated in you and me every single day. Day he's defeating sin, if we're following. And the days of love and bread are all about that. The Passover tells us all about the death penalty being paid. The days of unleavened bread tell us all about how he's defeating sin in us every day. That's why Christianity is a war. If you became a Christian because you wanted an easy life, you picked a really bad way to do it. Because you're in a war and Christ is going to destroy sin in you so that He can give you to the Father as a child. That's what He's going to do. He's going to defeat it in you. He's already defeated Satan. He's going to defeat it in you, in me. It's got to be beaten. It's got to be destroyed. It's got to be ripped out so we can be presented to the Father as a child. We will be like the heavenly man. We are the man of dust. We will be like the heavenly man. For the kingdom of God, the inheritance to be given, three things had to be defeated. And the inheritance is there for the children of God. Because what happened when Jesus came as the Lamb of God, died, was resurrected, and He's very active now. What is he actively doing now? Actually not defeating Satan. He comes back. What's the first thing he, one of the first things he does when he comes back? He binds Satan. He's already beating. Right now, what's he doing? He's defeating sin. He doesn't defeat death to the very end. He's already going to defeat it. He knows how he's going to do it, but he still has a work to do. The work of Jesus Christ is to defeat sin and every one of us. For us to be following that, to be submitting to that. Because when you really get down to it, the Lamb of God is a spiritual being who became flesh so that fleshly beings could become spirit. I want to remind you, February the 19th will be the next installment in this series. Thanks for coming out tonight, and have a safe trip home, by the way, because I know it's sort of, sort of messy out there.